We're going to bring um, Angelica Chavez Duckworth and Mr. Richard Mabian to the stage, but let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about them. Uh, Jelly <laughs> is a Kansas City native, a community organizer, and the founder of Live Zero. And Live Zero is a climate equity firm that partners with community-based and environmental organizations to develop upstream intersectional climate solutions that genuinely reflect community experience. In 2019, she won the LISC LISC Youth uh, Young Champion Award for her work in environmental justice. She is, and this is a really awesome part, a lover of waterfalls <laughs> and all things fungi. And then Mr. Richard Mabian, um, since 2006, he's worked as an independent community organizer in the environmental movement in Kansas City and the metropolitan region. The Pitch News organization selected Richard as their 2008 Activist of the Year for Kansas. In 2013, the National Sierra Club selected Richard as their 2013 Achiever of the Year. In 2014, the Kansas City, Kansas NAACP branch elected Richard as the president of their branch. He ran on an environmental literacy ticket. He was selected as man of the year for the EPA Region 7. Go ahead and put your hands together and let's bring Mr. Ramian and Jelly to the stage so that we can have conversation, educate me. Hello. And um, hello. Unfortunately, uh, Stacy again is not able to be with us, so we won't be able to dig into the 44th. Uh, we would have had a robust conversation, I'm sure. And so we're going to start with you, Jelly. Okay. <laughs> and um, first, before we we get going, I is it okay if I ask you to to define a couple things for me? Okay. So climate equity. This is a term that I have not heard before. Mm -hmm. Climate equity, what does that mean? Um, so like we saw in the film around environmental justice, climate equity is essentially the conduit, the vehicle uh, per se, to actually achieve our goals of environmental justice. And this is all encompassing both the socioeconomic issues that people place and face um, with this and how it's gonna be exacerbated by climate change as well as uh, the environmental health of our surroundings. So there's both the protection um, and as David said, the preservation and conservation of both people, our species and our environments. Yes, mm -hmm. and, you, and you both work in climate equity or you work in another term that is very similar, cultural equity. Is this are you asking me this? Yes, sir, I am. <laughs> Cultural equity. Hmm. Well, uh, I'm a Black American. Yes. And I spend quite a bit of my time trying to uh, decipher what it is that the uh, Black community is going to react to. And uh, a lot of the awards and stuff that you see them talking about me receiving have been discovering those kinds of circumstances. So I think that, first of all, uh, I'm not an environmentalist, I'm a freedom fighter. <laughs> and I ended up getting involved in the environment based on Katrina. When I saw Katrina with all those people milling around the Superdome looking lost as a former civil rights person, I knew exactly what was missing. You know, those people that we had in neighborhoods when we was growing up that you could depend on? You know, I'm not talking about elected officials or those kind of folks. I'm talking about little Mary down the street there. You go down there, baby, what's going on? I mean, tell me what's happening. You always had someone you could depend on. And when I saw those pictures in Katrina, I knew those people didn't exist anymore. When I came out of college, I got hired in the civil rights movement as a citizen participation specialist. And I got placed in a neighborhood to just go door to door and talk to people. Uh, and I know that I'm going on, but I'm gonna get this in. The worst in the environmental movement, the worst thing in the inner city is recycling. 
you just heard David talking about recycling and stuff, or you see it in the, the, the films, but in the inner city, they don't recycle, you know, and, and, and it's not because they don't want to, I don't think they've ever been talked to. And that goes back to that citizen participation specialist. The city came up with some buckets to give you some buckets and throw them out there and you're supposed to take them and go use them and they're not. So that, and that's the lowest hanging fruit. So when you talk culturally, mine is more geographically than it is uh, uh, ethnic, ethnicity. Sure. It, 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 it's more geographically, the low income community is being totally mistreated and abused. Yeah. So we're talking about the intersectionality of climate equity and cultural equity. Um, before we build upon that, can you tell me in terms of climate equity, how it's similar to or different from environmental justice? Yeah, I mean, to, um, you know, my counterpart's point here, I think it's, again, as you mentioned earlier, it's a vehicle. So what we're doing as community organizers of actually engaging and convening with people who are going to be most burdened by climate change, that is a process that is, that is going to actually enable self-determination so that we can actually live in communities where we can thrive and not just survive. And again, that is both ecological and at a community level. So when we talk about equity, what does that process look like? Who's involved? Who's the leadership? Who is the one designing the policies and programs, right? It should be the people who are going to be the most burdened by it. When we interlace the cultural equity piece, right? It is all encompassing of not just race, going beyond BIPOC and seeing things, because race is often interchangeable with LMI or low moderate income, which is not fair to those communities when they have other cultural assets, like they're a part of a church. They immigrated here from another country, so they speak other languages and have different traditions. So those things enable us to see these communities as assets first, which is extremely important to actually enable ownership, right, of a space but then also be able to understand things more holistically when we're looking at the problems that they face. So they may be in multifamily housing, language barriers. They may have grown up in the Northeast, right? Where there are not as many resources and the structures of the homes are different. When we understand everything all encompassing geography, where they're coming from and how we got here most importantly, that is what really that's all encompassing as we, thought, we talk about intersectionality, cultural equity, and moving people to take action so that we can live in a more environmentally just area. So what I hear you both saying is that there is um, a measure of education that has to happen uh, civically, but then also uh, with the, the citizens, right? So when you talk about recycling, and they want to, they may not know how, how do we ask people to participate in processes like recycling? Um, because I think what we saw in the film, The 44th, is, is there was a, yeah. a mandate, we're gonna charge you more money, we're going, right? Yeah. So how do we encourage people, educate people to participate on that side, but then you're also saying there has to be an awareness of the cultural assets that the people who live in these communities bring. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, first of all, I, I, if you all of you would do me a favor, let's get the word educate out. Mm -hmm. Okay, because when you talk to low income folks and you mm -hmm. talk to them in terms of we're going to educate you, that that's a put down to them. That's like you better than I am. And once you say that, I had to learn this the hard way. That's why I'm able to sit here and say it. You lose them. Yes. So the word we use is empower. We need to be able to empower people to understand what it is that they need to encounter. How do we get them to embrace the kind of circumstances that we see happening in our low-income communities? First of all, we need to separate people from that, 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 that falling between the crack group that dropped out of school at 16. I'm going to go out and be the next Jay-Z. 
Now they 25 to 30, got babies, a woman that they love, and no marketable skills. They don't qualify to work for anybody. The people that they can go work for used to be I would work at McDonald's when I was 16. I could work at McDonald's and you know and do my hustle at the night. McDonald's hiring 55 year old people. She <laughs> don't have them little job for that age group anymore. So we have to be able to look at it from a realistic standpoint. And, and, and what is it before, you know, you have to teach a person to, you have to feed a person before you can teach them to fish. And that the way it used to go, something like that in the Bible. Well, that's where we are. We have to make people, we have to satisfy people's financial circumstances. If I'm making enough money, $20 an hour would be enough money to satisfy somebody. You could put all the stickers you want on my trash because I got money to pay for it. Only time that's a problem is when you don't have the money. There's very little effort being made to put our low income people to work. One thing when uh, Dave was showing his movie, I said I was gonna make that comparison. He showed that as it was, as it, as it has materialized, but because I'm the first, you mentioned that the first black board member for the, for the Kansas Sierra Club, still the only black board member they got. I'm very much aware of the fact of the Flint Hills burning and all those kind of circumstances going on in Kansas was causing a lot of problem with the beauty that you were showing on your film. And so it has to become an issue that you can deal with. Well, that was the issue for out there in the out there in the wilds. When I come into the inner city, how many times they got to tell you that the people don't concentrate and think about that other stuff because they're trying to figure out how they're going to pay BPU or pay utility companies or pay their rent yeah. or buy some food. Yeah. So if that's what people are saying, what are we doing to get people working? Now, 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 this is just off the so, so my question is how, how, like, connect the dots for me. Okay. How, if we are feeding people, we yeah. are making sure they're paying the bills, the children got the clothes, everything. How does that translate into environmental uh, empowerment? That doesn't. Okay. That's just keeping people with, that's just a band aid. Mm -hmm. That's just pacifying folks and they'll go ahead and leave you alone. That's the way <laughs> Americans do So how that. do we get there? How do you, we get I'm there? I'm telling you the thing is, first of all, okay, I'll give you an example. The, the, all of y'all have to maintain this as intellectual property, so don't use it nowhere because you interfere with what I'm doing. Every home and building in America needs to be retrofitted. Every home and building. That includes in the inner city. Those homes that they show with that trash sitting out in front of it needs to be either torn down or retrofitted. And we cannot allow people that don't live in the neighborhood to be the ones that's doing the work. I stepped outside my house. I live over by the West Heights in Kansas City, Kansas. And I stepped outside my door, looked out my window the day before yesterday, and I got trucks working on the sewage in the pipes in the street from O'Fallon, Missouri. O'Fallon, Missouri. You know, now that's me. I'm, what the hell are we doing with O'Fallon, Missouri in Kansas City, Kansas? Right. We got people that need work. And if they don't have the skills to get hired, then why aren't we as a community finding ways to teach people those daggum skills? Because if I can't work and I can't get a job and I look up and see a truck outside my house that says O'Fallon, Missouri, that just takes me to another level of anger. Yes, sir. And Jelly, go ahead. I pose the same question to you. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanna, I wanna actually use that as a really awesome example. I argue that actually you can translate those things. Why is because we are humans and we are also part of this natural species that we are inherently entangled with and they're connected with, right? Um, those issues, so socioeconomic issues cannot be ignored when we're thinking about climate because everybody is affected. 
It looks like it in a neighborhood in the Kansas City West Side when they have some of the oldest infrastructure in the community that has a sewage and wastewater pipes they're going underneath in a completely flood zone. That is a climate issue. That is a health issue. When we know all of the data about the types of microbes that can be living in these spaces that are not healthy for us and pathogens and wastewater, when you're mixing those things and concentrating people there on top of hypergentrification, they can't get out. All I can think of is surviving. So how do you expect them to appreciate a flower? Yeah. I will argue though, part of my job to help translate it from the climate to the socioeconomic space is that reconnectivity to, to the land. You can have a compost in your backyard in the urban space. We can fight at the policy level to change the code so that we don't have to mow our lawns so that we can actually let them grow and be beautiful so people can take ownership. But that ownership is not gonna come unless we actually give them support. So can you give me an example of what that support looks like or uh, one thing mm -hmm. that's uh, being done to bolster the process uh, of the transition, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I've done a lot of work with youth and obviously in this movement, they are critical, right? Just as much as the people who have come before us are critical to learn from and pass the baton down, youth um, are extremely beneficial to this movement, period. So I, I worked with an awesome group called Mohives KC. They are a black owned uh, honeybee farm that is in the district, yeah. And uh, I'm very close with the founder, Dr. Mary Pearson. We actually developed a, a fellowship, an urban beekeeping fellowship with some of the Black and Latino youth um, in Kansas City to develop some type of pipeline for them to get into this space and recognize that it is here in our urban environment, in our backyard, right? And they got a plot of land and we learned the skills how to, how to promote stewardship of this space. I, and this is just a, a question off the cuff from myself, and I'm thinking about things being cyclical. Mm -hmm. uh, I just watched this uh, documentary. Oh, I wish I remembered the name of it. I just watched it. Um, but it was about millennials taking on environmental mm -hmm. change and justice. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I'm wondering if we come from traditions where we work the land, many of our forefathers are sharecroppers, we know how to plant, we know how to tend, we know how to reap and sow and harvest. And then how is it that we are back to a place where we need to relearn mm -hmm. the very skills and traditions of our forefathers and mothers? That, that group I was telling you about doesn't exist anymore. And the emphasis has gone away from individuals uh, maintaining, uh, uh, let's go with uh, raised bed gardens. That's a big thing right now. And uh, uh, what I have done, first of all, I created a, a what, what's called a 50-year pathway out of profit. That's the thing that has to be dealt with uh, and split into three groups, K through 12, 16 uh, to, to 24. That's an age group that's not being dealt with as far as the creation of marketable skills. The other group is the 25 to 54-year-old. Uh, the Department of Labor thought they were either disabled in school or in jail. And so they ran a, a, a survey, a test to see, and they weren't in any of those spots. And so me being me, and they, I'm in a meeting with them, and they go, well, where do you think they are? <laughs> Gave them the business. And I said, you know these guys that you see driving in front of the trash truck on trash days in their own vehicles, picking up salvageable stuff? That's where they are. They tire of the work, the, the working world. See, we they that this politics has ruined the working world. Uh, you talked about the millennials. If you want to see the millennials, that's that multicultural group of white, and black, Latinos, and Asians that were out there in the protests, not the ones throwing bricks and breaking in people's buildings, but those standing shoulder to shoulder, because what their complaint is. They're not getting a chance to be heard. 
They're not getting a chance to be heard. I mean, the people in charge don't give a damn about, excuse my language if I'm in a church. They don't give a damn <laughs> about, so uh, 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 about uh, 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 that, the, the millennials. Okay, they more concerned about still themselves and keeping their door open. And so they're out there on their own, man, and it's making it real hard. So we need to be able to, as a community, figure out ways to get these millennials out there so they can do their thing because they're closer to the group. Uh, a program that I'll shut up. <laughs> we created a program at Donnelly College. And what we did is had eight brick with Kansas City Community Gardens. We had eight raised beds put in over there in 2015. And it took some time because we just now get to a point where it's starting to be an active program. But the kids that came over from Donnelly, the students that actually planted the garden, I never forget last year. And they had one, I remember these girls, they didn't even know what a tiller was. And my guy taught them what a tiller was. And they got up in them raised beds and they was having a ball and they were planting potatoes and stuff like that. Well, what happened when they went home that evening, they started telling mom and pa and mama and whoever they got in them homes what they had done over at the public housing. And they wanted to show it and do it at the house. So they started finding ways to plant gardens at the house. Their parents that used to do that didn't think they cared. So they was glad to see them doing it. But the, but the key here is they got younger brothers and sisters sitting in them houses. Yes. And now them younger brothers and sisters are seeing something that when they grow up, they consider it to be commonplace. See, right now, when they go to elementary school and the teacher's talking about something to deal with climate change, those kids are sitting there going, what? But now when these young kids get there, they're going to be seeing something like, oh, wow, that's what Mary was doing at the house. I know this. <laughs> that's what we have. That comes from community organizing from the old school. Yes. Okay. You have to be able to bring all those people to the table yep. and, and de design strategy. That's where we are. I could talk to you all day about this, <laughs> but let me go ahead and pose this last question uh, before we open it up to uh, our virtual listeners. Uh, so what is place-based community-driven design? And I got a real cur a genuine curiosity uh, yeah. about what that means. Um, everything that Richard's been talking about and everything that we've been talking about. Um, and it starts actually wanted to touch on your back, the question you just posed and how that is interrelated with this. We need to recognize that the relationships that people may have had, whether sharecroppers, indigenous, that reconnection is still there. I've, I've seen it, people still have that, but we need to be careful about the trauma that is in that as well. When we talk about community driven, whether it's organizing or it's actually program development or it's creating a, a pipeline for youth to get into a job in place based, going back to that ownership and self determination, we need to understand the history of the place, of the people, right? Of their surroundings and how we got here in order for us to think about the solutions that are pertinent to that. Culture shifts block to block. So we have to understand that what may work something over on the east side is not going to work over on Wolf Park, mm -hmm. right? Community-driven place-based design is just a fancy word that the programs and policies that are to be made for those facing historic and marginalization should be created and benefited by them. That's another one of the conduit, the vehicle, how we get there. We organize them. We bring them to the table. We equip them, we find solutions for them that are pertinent to their issues specifically. If we don't have an ear to the ground, how are we going to actually understand what people need? You can't, mm -hmm. right? So all of that, it really does encompass both, again, the, the, I guess, philosophical and spiritual journey that this requires us to yep. hold yep. those places with, with honesty and also, again, with, with humility that people did come before us and they did this and we have to bring that back yes. in a way that's not triggering, but in a way that actually helps us move forward. So we're not basking in the past. 
Right. And that's why I'm going back to youth. I love working with youth. I have also worked with a lot of youth that were coming from refugees from Myanmar and Burma. And this is the things they did back home. Yeah. Why is it so special that they're doing it here? Mm -hmm. Make them feel at home again. Yeah. I, I want to throw something in there. And I'm getting uh, uh, some credit for bringing this to the table. Uh, can we all still hear him? Can you hear me okay? Because I can speak up. <laughs> she just mentioned the thing about the schools dealing with the youth, and that's really important that it needs to be done. But the problem is, in our inner city schools, which are a failure, you know, we got kids graduating with seventh grade reading uh, levels, you know, uh, and that's really detrimental. So all that great teaching that we're giving them in the school, robotics, you know, some, some class just won a robotic thing yesterday with uh, uh, Burns and McDonald's. They put a million dollars in the program. And the problem is those kids that are learning that in school, between school and home is so much degradation, that stuff that he had on that 44th Street stuff, that those kids end up losing what they learned in class by the time they get home because they're more worried and fearful about them pass through these neighborhoods. So when they get home, there's a guy, we call him Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob's been sitting around the house all day. Now, Uncle Bob, not necessarily into drugs and criminal activity. Uncle Bob is just, he didn't learn how to hustle and make things happen. Everybody loves him. The family loves him. Mama loves him. He's more security than anything because they got a man in here that's keeping the riff rats from being around. It. And the girls love him and he's, <laughs> he's, he is the hit with those young kids. Instead of seeing what they learned in school as being the role model, they see Uncle Bob as being a role model. So in the work that we're putting together, we're going, what we need to do while we're working with those youth is also getting Uncle Bob to work. You know, the kids need to see Uncle Bob coming home on Thursday night with a little skip in his step. You know, patting him on the head. He's happy. Why? Because Friday's payday. Remember, that's the way it was when we was growing up. Them, them men in the neighborhood would be excited. Oh, boy. Well, black kids growing up now don't have that. The only excitement they see, drug dealers. Okay, now, but those drug dealers are there because that's their means of making money. So, so I'm just saying we have to look at the total picture yes. and get it generational. That's what we're working on right now. I don't want y'all to think this is not happening because we are studying and trying our best to create this model. You will say, you heard it first, and Richard, you people at home listening, don't, you own the intellectual property thing too. You didn't know it, but you are. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead and give a round of applause for that one. <laughs> for, for Mr. Marion and Uncle Bob. <laughs> Uncle Bob. Uncle and speaking Bob. of Uncle Bob, uh, right. can, you, can you hear us? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Do we have uh, any questions from our virtual audience? Yes, I have a question from you. I was referring to the Kansas City Climate Protection Group, so I was wondering what the panel's opinion is and how well it addresses um, climate equity. It doesn't do a good job, and I'll be the first one to say that. Um, I am one of the climate justice workers that have been working on the plan. And it's not over yet, but it was not designed to be uh, to lead to really equitable outcomes. Yeah. I'll be I, the first one to say that no. being an internal employee of the plan. The barriers to that, which I think are important to lift, are structural and institutional and bureaucratic. Yeah. That means the things that I was given to do my job well, including support. <laughs> so. Um, and when you say including support, financial, uh, personnel, financial, support. personnel, yeah. structural, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. it was not necessarily set up to win um, in this space, but I don't think that the fight is over. No, and, and, and it wasn't set up for low-income communities, and uh, they will they will tell you that. 
they will actually say, we have no clue how we're going to deal with that. That's what's made my job to joy because I don't have anything to have to, no barriers to have to go over except finance and we're working on that. Um, it, it, it's a plan that is, that is, I won't say superficial, is, is doing what the system is saying needs to be done, it looks good. I hope they get a lot of money behind it, but nothing that they're doing has anything to do with, um, with the basic population. You know, there's no job training in there. You know, it's all about the system itself. And we got to get people working. I'm sorry, folks. If you talk to anybody out here that's engaged in any kind of work, they will tell you in the neighborhoods, we need to get people working. And that is a must. And if we're not doing that, then we're just spinning our wheels in the mud. You'll have them and you'll have those. Basically, that's what we're doing. We are separating the two masses that live in this country. That's it. Okay, any other questions? I'll tell you what. It was a wonderful question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any questions from the audience here in the room? I love that you spoke to the, uh, the environmental justice and social justice, and they can't, they can't exist without the other. And right. recently, just what piggybacking on what that question was, um, and I'm not going to drink about to be real. Insti it supports it institutionally, but it's like throwing money at a problem without giving the without giving money to the infrastructure yeah. and really getting into the nitty nitty gritty. I'm sure there are countless examples of that, but I'm really glad you spoke spoke to that because it's bungee jumping in the community. Right, right. And you know, the nonprofit complex is still an institution. Right. And it's well intentioned people, but right. it doesn't get into it's, the nitty gritty. Right. But the community activism and developing students as well as the Uncle Bob's, like you yeah. mentioned, yeah. right. it's such a multi pronged approach. That's right. It's so much bigger than, any, than recycling is going to be. But, but what you're doing is, is, is visible enough that you can use it for them to understand that we're not doing that in the urban community. If you had had a film that didn't have nothing but flowers, then that means you just got one aspect of what's out there that you could have been filming. I mean, you went through the whole gamut, even down to the fires, and you didn't see a whole lot about the fires. You could have told the fact that when those fires are going on, the biggest loss is prairie chickens because they thought of fire and they haven't got no place to go. So they have figured out a way that when they have to do that burning in Flint is to burn one side of the road one time, and that way it lets all the prairie chickens run over to that side that they're not burning. So they are working with it. In other words, they're just not out there just blatantly going through it. That's not happening in the inner city, but we are working on it. We are, we're going in that direction, um, trying to create a prototype in Kansas City to show what can be done to bring people together. The word is siloed. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the system, the political systems created siloed organizations. You, they like to talk in terms of activists. You can have activists living next door to each other that don't even know what the other one's doing. Yes. Community organizing needs to be at the table yep. so that we're working in concert with each other. The businesses, the churches, I don't care what it is, needs to be working in concert with each other. So that way we can design strategy. Yep. We are, we are gonna have to move <laughs> along. I am so sad about this because I really could talk more. Me yeah. personally, I suffer from tunnel vision and I think that um, perspective is huge. You know, uh, I, I, I'm a vegan, you know, yeah. um, but I'd say I don't suffer from hyper-veganism hyper because I grew up with a grandpa right. who hunted and fished. Right. Okay, he taught us how to garden. I know how to plant some tomatoes and feed myself if I need to. And so for me, I'm always so proud of that. And hearing you talk about the attitudes and the perspectives of what that kind of work 
means to younger people, I just have so much to learn. Yeah. So I think this conversation is is rich and deep and 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 definitely necessary. I hope we can, like you said, become orchestrated. Well, I, I thank you for having it. Yes. I, uh, when, 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 when Patricia called me and talked to me, I, I immediately said yes. I didn't even care about the question. It's just <laughs> the fact that you're having it because the work that we're doing all you got to do is put us here. I guarantee you, we got something to say. I think you've seen that with me tonight, but I mean, <laughs> that, that happens. <laughs> this has been wonderful. Uh, where can we find you uh, <laughs> online, on social media? How can we connect uh, with your organizations? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 we'll do that. Uh, we'll, we'll connect yeah. with you after the program. Yeah, we we'll have one, one more film uh, for tonight. Um, it's not just about the climate change, change activist uh, Greta Thunberg. Thunberg, the, the little, I, well, I should say things like that. I, I was going to say the little cutie because I think she's so cute. <laughs> um, it looks to the future and hope. Hope is the big word, David. Um, and both attempts to define what we need to do and encourage our young people to do it. Make the world Greta again. And this is about, uh, this is by Vice Video. And so um, we're gonna watch it here, but then you can also uh, find it later as well. And this uh, concludes the program. I'll come on after and say thank you, uh, but we will not have another Q&A. Thank you so much.